Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Elle McNichol to this event tonight. Um, Elle is an award-winning Scottish children's author. Your debut novel, A Kind of Spark, won the Blue Peter Book Award and the Waterstones Children's Book Prize, as well as the Blackwell's Book of 2020. Um, you are Carnegie nominee, nominated and you have been shortlisted for the Books Are My Bag Awards 2020, the Branford Bose Award and the Little Rebels Awards. You are currently working, I think I'm right in saying this, Elle, you're currently working on a live action TV adaptation of A Kind of Spark, which is super exciting. Um, your second novel, Shows Who You Are, was chosen by The Observer as one of the best children's books of 2021. It was Blackwell's Book of the Month and one of the bookseller's best books of 2021. Your third novel, Like a Charm, was published quite recently on the 3rd of February, um, and I'm three quarters of the way through it. Um, the reviews coming in are absolutely fantastic, and I agree with them. Elle, you're here to talk with us for about 20 to 25 minutes. Again, it's just an absolute pleasure to welcome you to this event, um, and I'll pass it over to you now, Elle. Welcome. Wow, thank you so much, Derek. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Mortifying to listen to, but <laughs> thanks so much. Um, that was very kind. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to be here this evening um, talking to all of you. Thank you for giving up your time. I know it's that, you know, it's a bit, we're a bit tired of Zoom maybe, but it's really, really lovely that you've all tuned in. Um, yeah, I am going to try and talk for 25 minutes. And I was just saying to the team before we got on that I'm very used to doing events with young children. <laughs> My not do that many events with adults so I'm going to try and slow down and not talk as quickly because I usually get very caught up in their energy and we have a very interactive back and forth and um, my readers are very passionate and very enthusiastic um, so I'm going to just enjoy the opportunity of taking it slow um, but yeah my name is Elma Nicol I'm originally from uh, Juniper Green outside Edinburgh so I am a Scottish author and um, I'll get to that because it's sort of touched on in my first book but um, I'm a children's author and I write primarily for children eight and older and I say older because I have a lot of adult readers <laughs> who have no connection to children they are not parents they are not teachers they are not librarians they're not they're just <laughs> like the books so I, I don't like to put an upper age limit on my books but um my start into the industry is a little bit different to most authors um so I do like to talk a little bit about that and it's to do with representation and it's to do with diversity and inclusivity which I know is something that librarians care about I know it's something that the um you know that the industry as at large is is starting to care about <laughs> so I'll talk a bit about that and um I first of all I suppose it started 20 years ago when I was um, 9, 10 and I was in that hyperlexic stage where young children are, who love to read are really going through books at an absolute rate and the librarian was probably sick of me and um, I was really walking out of the library every week with a big stack of books and I love to read and I did start to notice after maybe a year of intense reading that there was nobody in a book like me and when I say like me, I mean that I'm neurodivergent, I'm autistic, and I also have a learning difficulty, um, which I was diagnosed with at a young age. So I'm very aware of, as a lot of children who are diagnosed young and a lot of children who I'm sure you work with are aware of. Um, and it was not ever in the page of any book that I read. And I, I talk about that now as something that's very impactful, but obviously at the time, children don't think in that way. They don't read a book and go oh I was not accurately represented in this book or I, the author does not include me in their in their world in this literary world we don't think in those terms it's something very subconscious it's something very um unspeakable and it was just something I accepted as totally normal I just thought disability in general to be honest was was pretty poor in literacy uh 20 years ago and I just accepted it I thought that's not a world where we are allowed to inhabit we are not you know we're never the main character we're, we're always tiny tim 
or Smike in Nicholas Nickleby. Uh, we're never a protagonist and we are always an object of pity and, and not, not somebody who has agency. And, and if, you know, even those representations were very, very few and far between. So um, that was what I grew up with and I accepted it as totally normal. And it wasn't until I got to my twenties and I was working in publishing and I was trying to get a job in editorial um, that I started to really bring this up with children's publishers. So I'd be in meetings with someone in, who's in a big skyscraper in London Bridge, <laughs> one of these terrifying publishers. And um, and they would say, well, you know, why do you work in children's publishing and, and what do you care about in children's publishing? And I said, well, I really think there needs to be better disability representation. And every single time <laughs> I said this, their faces would just go like, nope and I would just watch these people absolutely shut down before we'd even had a conversation and I'd say no 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 look I really you know I this is not a gimmick I genuinely think it's important because without getting into and I can talk about this because um, this is a library event it's not not young children I can talk about how it's so important this representation because the research I, I was doing when I was working in publishing I found you know six out of ten parents do not want neurodivergent children in the classroom with their children who are neurotypical meaning they don't want autistic children or children with learning difficulties in their classrooms that's six out of ten and that's the six out of ten that will admit to it um, and the employment rates are very poor because of prejudice and because of stigma and because of low self-esteem and there's you know all these statistics I could rattle off and I did to these publishers I would rattle off these statistics and I say you know this is why it's it's an area of inclusivity that's being neglected when I go to diversity and inclusivity panels nobody mentions disability nobody even you know utters the word and sometimes you can't even get into you know the building's not even accessible there's no lift to get to this diversity panel so it's not even accessible to disabled people so I said it's really really bad you guys to, to these industry people I say it's really not good um, and you know all of that aside all of the statistics aside all of the moral reasons aside I think that there's so much untapped potential there in, in children's publishing there's so many voices that we're not hearing and I started to hear things like well we can't publish books like that because booksellers wouldn't like them and we always have to think about what booksellers like and what Waterston's like and that you know that's a big market for us and we don't think booksellers would like books like that which is a, a mad thing to say and I had been a bookseller but I didn't tell them that they had obviously hadn't read my CV <laughs> um, but, um, and then I'd go into another publishing house and I'd do the same again and they'd go well you know we are very we, we care a lot about how we sell our books abroad and we wouldn't be able to sell those books abroad we wouldn't be able to sell them to you know places like Asia Asia really don't like imperfection and they would not like books like that and I thought well, that's a huge generalization for an entire continent but okay and I again I logged that way and I thought gosh wow that people really have their answers ready for why they don't have disability in children's books I think a part of me expected to kind of walk into these rooms and they'd go oh you're right we never thought about that that was just an oversight we will fix but they no, they had their answers ready as to why they did not want to do this and uh, they said you know we couldn't have an autistic child as a hero in, in foreign markets they wouldn't buy it they wouldn't you know it wouldn't sell it's a, you know it would just be a waste of a book and I thought oh gosh okay and then I would go to another one and they would say well we care a lot about what teachers and librarians like and they prefer books where you know the disabled character is sort of the object and not the subject you know whereas you know and they were like you know if we had a book where the main character was like the sibling of a disabled person that would be great and I thought well I can show you the statistics on how those books sell and they're not good but um yeah okay but and that's another point which is that that's a very common narrative we see in publishing which is the disabled child is very othered and I would challenge anybody who reads a book like that to take themselves out of it and then ask yourself what you would feel if you were a disabled child reading a book like that if you were reading about how you're such a burden or something to be pitied or your your brother slash sister slash school friend has so much trouble you know relating to you all of these things I don't think anyone who's published those books not naming any names I don't think anyone's ever thought for a minute what it would be like for a disabled child to read that because I was that disabled child I read those books and they did not make me feel good um and they don't sell so I, I don't know why they still write them but uh, so that that kept coming up as well they said well you know we do write about we do have disability books and I said not by disabled authors you don't have any disabled authors on your list from what I've seen um so it was a very as you can maybe starting to tell by by the narrative I'm I'm giving that it was not a positive experience and nobody was really 
there was a lot of sort of patting on the knee and going, oh, we get why it's a, it sh- would be a nice idea, but it's not possible. It's not something we can do. Um, and I just sort of left always very demoralized. And I went home to uh, my tiny little flat in London where I am now. I'm sorry, it's getting progressively darker. We, we don't have many windows. Um, but um, I came home to this little flat and I said, um, I can't do this anymore. You know, I love the world of books. I love children's books. I, I've loved reading since I was a child. I've, I've, you know, my teachers taught me to love reading and my librarians taught me to love reading. And I really thought that this was a world where, you know, anything's possible, but it's not. These people are, they are firmly shutting this gate. They are not going to open it. And my boyfriend said, go on one last meeting, just see if it's any better. And I said, I'm trying to get a job in publishing, which, you know, is is so difficult anyway. And they just don't want to hear it. You know, they just don't want to listen to me. The only interviews that have been successful where I've been offered a job are the ones where I've just shut up and not mentioned disability. And that's pretty telling. And he said, go on one last meeting. And this one last meeting was with um, a publisher called Nights Of who are tiny there's about six people <laughs> and then that are the small tiny little press and they're in Brixton and I was meeting with David Stevens who is the co-founder and was at that point um one of the main publishers and I I they were so lovely I sent a live chat message on their website I said can we have a meeting about disability in children's books please and David said yes of course and if any of you know David Stevens I feel like David knows everyone so I, I should just you know say if you if you do know David you'll know that David is phenomenal and if you don't know David I look forward to the day you get to meet him because he's absolutely phenomenal but um David said come into Brixton we'll have a meeting and I came and we we sat in a coffee shop and David's the loveliest person and so personable so perfect for publishing just so amicable and I sat across from David and I went listen I am sick and and I just like ranted for 10 minutes and I got out my my like statistics and I said this publisher said this and this person said this and I've written all the things I said down and I'll never forget this and David was going oh wow okay yeah and I said and I know that you're a brilliant publisher you know you published Jason Reynolds you published Sharna Jackson you know your whole ethos as a publisher and this is true nights of only publish inclusive books and they do it well and they do it you know authentically and it's not something that's just slapped on at the last minute it's incredibly thorough I said I love what your publishing house is doing but people need to understand that disability is part of diversity and it's important and then I sat back and I was sort of like (sighs) and David said that's all great um we don't have any job openings because we're tiny but have you written a book and I said have I written a book? I'm not a writer. I don't know. I've not written a book. I I am going to be an editor. I'm going to edit children's books. I mean, I have two thirds of something in a drawer, but you wouldn't want to read it. And he was like, I would want to read it. And uh, that was a kind of spark, which was my first novel. And um, I ran home and finished the ending. <laughs> it hadn't been finished and sent it off. And two weeks later, it was published. And um, it's a visual in case anyone's not seen it. This is a kind of spark. And um it was published six months later. There was a little pandemic in, in, in that time, but who cares? Um, and when the book was about to come out, all of those things that were said to me did come back. I did think maybe they were right. Maybe they weren't just dinosaurs who were stuck in the past. Maybe they were all actually correct. Um, maybe it will crash and burn. Um, and it, it didn't crash and burn. It was, it, it, it was actually something that's formed a, a really meaningful community with, for me, with my readers um, of people who've been sort of waiting for representation. And I should say, because um, I don't know, you know, people probably don't know me but a kind of spark is about a girl called Addie and she's autistic and that's one of the themes of the book and she's very open and honest and happy about it and she learns that her small town in, in Scotland loosely based on my village um that they hunted witches long ago and she thinks that's horrible and also quite fascinating and she decides to campaign for a memorial to be made in honor of those witches and that's the story and that's the plot that autism is not the plot which is something I'm very very passionate about and um it's all about sisterhood in school and what it was like to be a neurodivergent child in a school where maybe they don't fully (laughs) have the best inclusivity policies and so the story is about putting an autistic character in the main role with agency with heart that's disproving a lot of the the sort of harmful narratives that we've seen in children's publishing so far and um and it's not an issue book it's not you know a sad depressing (laughs) tragic as you can maybe tell by the cover it's quite (laughs) colorful um and it, it did it did you know it is a bestseller and it did sell abroad we have copies we have versions coming out in China and Japan and Korea you know just to 
uh, defend Asia against the <laughs> publishing industry. They, Asia have absolutely embraced it. Um, and in America as well, it's coming out. And, um, and then I'll quickly talk about the other two books I've written just as an, an insight into why I wrote them and um, why I wanted to write genre because having said all of that I, I think it's so important I love a kind of spark and it's contemporary and, and it really sort of stamped how I felt about neurodivergent writing but I also think neurodivergent children deserve to see themselves in genre they deserve to see themselves having adventures that are not just contemporary stories so show us who you are is it's science fiction but it's very speculative there's no aliens there's no um you know outer space it's all sort of black mirror-esque stepward wives kind of sci-fi but the reaction that children have to this one in particular is incredibly meaningful to me because, I mean, first of all, boys love this one the most, which I, I love because it kind of spark. Um, actually, I was really worried boys wouldn't like it, but I have so many boys come up to me at school visits. They go, I love a kind of spark, but where are the boys? Because there's so many girls in a kind of spark. And I said, OK, well, there's boys in this one um, and they really love this one. Um, and again it's genre and like charm as well it's literally I don't think I think it's been out just over a week um <laughs> it's been a bit of <laughs> been a bit of a haze but um it's fantasy and it's about magic in Edinburgh and this is starring a character who's dyspraxic like me with learning difficulties and again the reaction I can see it in schools when I talk about this book um because I'm promoting it at the moment and I do I do my speech and I say I'm an author I write books about neurodivergent children and I am a neurodivergent author myself and I had learning difficulties and I was diagnosed when I was nine and I can see their heads sort of slowly going up and I can see I can see individuals in the audience going like that can't be true <laughs> because it's one thing to, to tell children you can do anything you can be anything which I know is what children are told as they should be but it's another thing to see it and you can't be what you can't see so when children do see an author who is like them whether it's a black author or a disabled author um or an author of a different religion they they really make that connection and they realize that it's not just something people say to them that they can do it do anything so that's why all the books are important for me to talk about in that context and to say you guys I, I was very bad at school I was not a an academic overachiever I had learning difficulties I was in a special educational needs workshop it was very damaging to my self-esteem no matter how well meaning everyone involved was I didn't think I would ever go to university I was told I wouldn't I didn't think I would ever be able to hold down a job and I and I do now and I write books full-time and and it's really important for me to say that in schools so that they see it and they hear it and they really understand that I'm not, this is not a gimmick, this is real. Um, and it's important to me before I um, wrap up my, <laughs> I mean, I hope I've not bored every, any, everyone. I hope we haven't dropped off too many people, but um, I'll wrap up with just um, talking a little bit about what the readers have have done for, for these books and um, what librarians have done and what teachers have done. Teachers and librarians in particular have been monumental to this book's success because Knights of our uh, they're a small press, like I said, we don't have the money to put books in supermarkets. They don't have the money to put them in WH Smith. I can't get into the industry secrets, but that, you know, that's just not something that a small press can do in that sense. Um, and yet the teachers and librarians, I think, put their had faith in Knights of and knew their reputation and knew their backlist. And, and because of that, they embraced the book. And, and it was really word of mouth that made my first book the success that it was. And yes, now it's being made into a television show. And um, God bless the BBC. I think they're very exhausted of having to deal with me <laughs> always sending scripts back and going, you can't say that. That's not, that's not, um, you know, that's not going to make children feel good you have to say this um so that's a whole new journey as well now bringing neurodiversity rep to television in a way that is hopefully more inclusive but yes librarians and teachers have been phenomenal and um, whether it's choosing the book as a, the books as read alouds um i know that show us who you are is popular as a class read because it's got some real twists and cliffhangers um but whether it's you know autism or learning difficulties um these books are hopefully stories first because that's what I do I start with character I start with story and I'm not interested in writing issue books I'm not interested in writing books where everyone learns a lesson by the end I think that's incredibly dull um, I'm interested in writing stories that I hope children read under the covers with a torch and I know that many do um, and representation is just part of that and it's woven into the story and it's not something that is plopped in at the beginning and then never mentioned again it's not something that is shoehorned in it's something I write for my own life 
life from my own experience I remember vividly what it's like to be 12 years old and going through that 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 relationship with my own neurodiversity I remember what it was like I remember the things people said and a lot of that goes into the books and a lot of that is what my readers write to me and say this resonated with me there's a little girl in Canada that got in touch um, via her aunt to say I didn't like saying I was autistic before a kind of spark now I say it to everybody and I love it and I know that GPs give the books out to their patients and I know that um I have had letters from people in prisons I've had letters from people who are 60 years old and have just been diagnosed because of the book and it's the most remarkable um community that has formed and that's because of librarians it's because of teachers it's not because of supermarkets or fancy award shows it's because of the word of mouth effect and seeing the change that positive representation can make within a good story where it's something that the, ch the children can talk to their friends about the plot but inside they also are thinking and also it's about me it's an exciting story whether it's genre whatever it is whether it's Addy or Cora or Ramia but they're inside they know it's for me for once it's for me it's not for them it's for everyone but I know she wrote it for me and that's why I always say to them you know I have children come up to me at signings and that's why I get emotional but it's, it's the truth they come up and they say I know you wrote this book for me and I always say yes I did I wrote it for you um and that's that's ultimately that's probably a good place to end on because that is what representation should be it shouldn't be this uh box ticking exercise it shouldn't be a business move from a publisher it should be something that is authentic that is a touchstone and from my life to theirs that is incidental and doesn't take over the plot but is just solidly there sort of holding the reader's hand from the first page to the last going I see you I know it you are seen, you are in this world, you have agency, you're valid, and most of all, you're enough as you are. And that's what I do with my books. So thank you. Um, and hopefully there's questions that we can do some back and forth because I don't like to just talk and talk. Um, but thanks so much for coming and I'd love to hear your thoughts and get to some interactive questions and answers if we can. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, there's so much to unpack there. Um, <laughs> I could spend hours speaking about this, but I think we should we should maybe go to a few questions first. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, one mm -hmm. from Angela, and her question is: Growing up, was there an author whose books you just couldn't put down? Perhaps you still have dog-eared copies that are treasured on your bookshelves at home. What was it about their books that you love so much and did they inspire you to write yourself? That's a great question. Um, having talked a lot about how I didn't see myself in books growing <laughs> up, I don't want people to, th there were so many fantastic books that I loved. Um, I don't, I think the one I read the most was probably Jacqueline Wilson. And I don't know if that's a controversial answer because I remember a lot of librarians when I was younger ban banned her. She wasn't allowed in some libraries, um, but I just, I and I respect her so much now looking back because I think wow you really did write about um situations and characters that I think the industry even now would would say that's not appropriate for books which is classist and, and wrong but I I remember really ripping through her books and I would you know recognize myself in characters like Treasure and like Lola Rose who you know get overexcited about a, a seven pound coat from a catalog and I just thought you know this this writer is knows the world like she knows the world I live in and um, so it's probably Jacqueline Wilson and she was a machine she was turning out like two a year so you know that was that was helpful as well but I, and then I read a lot of Anne Fine um, my most dog-eared copy of a book is probably it's a book called The Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. Um, I think now I've been told I said this somewhere else and they said oh that was on the Washington shortlist in whatever year and I was like I was eight years old I didn't care about the Washington shortlist <laughs> I just liked the book but that's probably how I ended up with it um, and it was a retelling of a fairy tale and it was very um, girl power and I liked it a lot I probably probably read that one the most that was the most dog years The Goose Girl by Shannon Hale um, which was given to me by a librarian so um, that was great um, yeah so I did love reading I did love lots of authors despite my commentary about <laughs> representation <laughs> excellent um I'm, I'm i'm intrigued to hear that you um some librarians banned uh jacqueline Wilson. one librarian and she banned i don't know what i mean she must have like i 
you know, a library is a curated space. It, it, a good librarian has a point of view. They have, a, you know, there's, you know, if I was a librarian, there are books that I probably wouldn't wouldn't stock. But it was interesting. Yeah, I, I just maybe because it was just really popular. Maybe she was like, you know, you can get these books anywhere, which is true. We, we could. So it was a good way of getting us to read people like Robin McKinley or, mm. um, you know, more more um, not so popular authors, I suppose. I don't think it was a, a moral. I don't think it was <laughs> like a moral stance. I don't <laughs> think she was like against people like Tracy Beaker. I think she just um, was like, you can get this at Tesco's. You don't need to to have shelves and shelves of this in the library you can and I think that was more it but um yeah I just remembered that now actually but yeah that's but she was the most popular author when I you know and of course Harry Potter I mean I you know I was born in the 90s you couldn't avoid Harry Potter but um but um Jacqueline Wilson's the one I remember the most being sort of like the auto buy author and um, I've got another question here from KC who asks do you make a careful list of characteristics for your characters in advance favourite food, lucky number, colour, birthday, superstitions before you start out, or do they develop slash show your new details as they evolve on your pages? I mean, that's such a nice question. And um, the answer is that sort of both happen. I definitely start from character, all three of my books. Um, the one thing, I mean, it's very common with middle grade authors, and I write middle grade, and everyone will know this if, you know, as their librarians, but um, it's very common for middle grade authors to kind of stay in their lane as it were so if they write murder mysteries they write murder mysteries and if they write fantastical russian fairy tales they write fantastical russian fairy tales and my books all jump from genre to genre which is unusual but the one thing that does connect all of them uh, is a neurodivergent main character so i'm always starting from a neurodivergent main character and i'm always starting with that character for months usually before anything is written and just trying to work out who they are what they want what they're scared of those are the questions I tend to ask more than do they have a lucky number although I love that I think that's really that's maybe what I've been missing but um I do sort of think you know what do you want why does the story start now why does it have to happen now what what's what are you looking for what are you scared of who's your nemesis what is your wound um the character and in, in, like charm really has a wound that needs to heal um so it's about you know, just asking all these questions and kind of like how an actor would prepare for a role and probably every bit is self-indulgent and, and irritating to, to hear but you just sort of sit with the character for months and months that's what that's what I do anyway um, and then when I feel like I know exactly who they are I write the book and it's so much easier that way because I can just answer all the questions that come up in those little kind of plot walls you hit um, because you know the character so well so in a sense yes I do think about their favorite color and their birthday and all that's you know but I'm I don't I'm not someone that goes well my character is a Sagittarius so they would do this um but but I do know them sort of inside out so that's that's the easiest way to write a book I think um is to have the character and know exactly I mean it's their story um and most children's books are about if not about the hero's journey they are about um the main character or, they, or the good ones are I think so um so you have to know that character inside out and they have to be flawed they can't be a perfect little Mary Sue who is good at everything and loves everyone and is loved by everyone because that's incredibly dull um so you know in a kind of spark it's all about Addie wants to get this memorial made and that um she also wants to be heard and understood so that moves the plot and show us who you are. Cora wants to find out what's happening at this, this company that uses artificial intelligence. And that becomes kind of almost thriller-esque in the way that she's navigating what's going on behind closed doors. And in like Charm, Ramia is very motivated by filling up her book that's been left to her with magical creatures that she meets in Edinburgh. So they are all motivated with things that move the plot forward. And that, that really does help. And I have to also figure out why do they want that? Um, so yeah, it's a really great question. Um, see and I could talk about that for longer but yeah I think knowing your main character and also your villains knowing all the characters really well is the easiest way to to complete a book it's easy to start a book but the easiest the best way to finish one is to know everyone inside out I think I'm, I might read out a couple of comments if you don't mind El, oh, um, in, the, in, the, in the chat here there's one here from Carol Ann Neal it says as a teacher a kind of spark has been phenomenal at supporting inclusive education and creating a culture of empathy, kindness, and expecting and respecting differences, also has engaged reluctant readers, improving so many literacy outcomes within the curriculum. It has inspired my learners to develop a love for reading, so well written and relatable. Thank you, Elle. Genius. Oh, Caroline. <laughs> oh, <what a> comment. <laughs> That's so lovely. I think, I think, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, 
for saying something that I think everyone wants to hear when they write a book, which is that reluctant readers are picking it up because we are obviously in a, in a stage where it's so difficult to get anyone, not just children, adults as well, to mm-hmm. focus on a book um, when there are flashing games to play and things to swipe and things to scroll. It's really difficult to for anyone. I, I think too much and too many adults are harsh on children about it when they themselves are always on their iPad. So it's really difficult. And when I get letters from children who say, I've, this is the first book I've ever read. I always think, God, that's, that is the most incredible thing to hear. And I do try when I, I do try and write the books in an accessible way, meaning that I think if you turn a page of my book and you haven't missed anything plot wise, that's not good. I try and keep things moving. I try and keep the you know kids engaged when they read. And um, I'm aware of how much visual, um storytelling they're used to now mm-hmm. with television and with film my books are very visual it's describing mm-hmm. a lot of people's expressions and describing how things but not going into long pages and pages of describing you know what the wallpaper looks like because I remember being nine and thinking I don't care what the wallpaper <laughs> looks like so it's not it's about putting your reader's experience before sort of literary um I don't know what the word would be probably not anything polite but it's about remembering that you're writing for young people and that they need to be engaged and they need to, uh, to turn that page. So um, when you hear lo- that reluctant readers have engaged in the in the book, that is unbelievably exciting. Um, my father is semi-literate. He doesn't read books. And because of audiobooks, he is now getting to hear my books and they're the first books that he's ever read. And that's incredibly exciting. And I just, I think that's, uh, you know he's in his 60s that's why he's never diagnosed with dyslexia which I think is what it probably is um so when reluctant readers pick up the books like I'm getting emotional all over again Caroline thank you um but when they pick up the books it's the, it feels like it feels like we've sort of beaten a hidden enemy that we can't see it feels like yes like this is this is a success so that's a wonderful thing to hear thank you Caroline yeah absolutely Carla. I, 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 I thoroughly agree it's such a it's a great feeling when in the library when I see a, a student borrow a book for maybe for the first time or get engaged in a book for the very first time, particularly your books, Elle, I have to say. I've got um, a, a lovely bunch of uh, students who are neurodiverse and who are absolutely thrilled with your books. And some of them, it's the first time they've, they've read a book all the way through. It's fantastic. Um, I have another comment here from uh, Kelly Marshall, who said, I shared a kind of spark with my year sixes and I really enjoy going on the journey with them. I'm autistic with Asperger's syndrome, and there were a lot of things and the kind of spark that I could relate to. This encouraged me to share more of my own experiences with the children. It encouraged me to be me. So thank you, Elle. Thank you for writing a book that appeals to everyone. Oh gosh. (laughs) Kelly, thank you so much. I think you've said something amazing there, Kelly, which is that you get to talk about you with, and you probably won't appreciate it as much until you see the the finished results but you just saying hey look I'm autistic as well you their teacher who they love and who they respect that is enormous I didn't see any neurodivergent adults when I was a kid nobody I thought we disappeared when we turned 18 it just didn't seem to be something that existed so you will have done enormous things just just normalizing that for them so that's incredible thank you for saying that Kelly um yeah I I I would always want to write books that teachers can have a nice class read with their students and they can talk about things and they are free to say you know ask questions I always say when I do school visits you can ask me any question you want any question I'm not going to be offended because we have to talk about this in order to understand it and I know what I'm talking about so I'm going to you know answer in a way that's not going to stigmatize or um you know exclude anybody and I never ask anyone to to out themselves you know I'm always happy to talk about my own experience but it's such a such an amazing thing um Kelly when you know a teacher like you or a student says actually I am this and I've had children stand up and say I'm autistic and everyone in the room goes are you and (laughs) it's the first time they've ever said it because they sort of are going like oh yeah it's fine. It's not this thing that the media tells me is a horrible disease or something to be ashamed. It's fine. It's just a different brain. And I always tell the kids, you know, I'm like a Samsung and most people are iPhones. We do the same thing. We're just doing it in a different way. Um, and and then they all go like, oh, OK, um, so it's thank you, Kelly. That's that really means a lot to me. And you'll have you'll have done enormous things for your class by being vulnerable and sharing that with them. I um, have another uh, question here from Pamela. Um, Elle, I love the covers for all your books. 
do you get ah. anything to say in Holy Luke? <laughs> um, <laughs> you get very little say in publishing about a lot of things that publishers <laughs> do but um, yeah so I'll hold up kind of spark its original cover which is pink and blue and I saw this and I wept because I loved it and I loved it because it's a bubblegum book and it's the kind of book I'd have picked up when I was 12 I'd have gone like I have to have this pink book mom and my mom would have said what's it about and I said I don't care I just have to have it <laughs> But um, but then there were all these people whispering, going like, "Well, the boys pick that up. Well, they pick that up." And um, boys always are fine with it, but sometimes their grandparents are a bit scared. But um, <laughs> have a green one in case you're um worried about the color pink. There's a green one as well. But no, I don't get any say in them. And they're designed by I'm going to hold up the other two. They're designed by Kay Wilson, and Kay is an artist who did not work in the book industry. She worked primarily on her, you know, freelance and on Instagram and she's ADHD. And her art is so unique that whenever I see these books on the Watterson's table, and this one's on a lot of Watterson's tables at the moment, um, which is really cool. It's my first non-lockdown book. And every time I see it on the table, I kind of have a moment where I'm like, gosh, it really doesn't look like anyone else's. It looks like so individual but that's exactly what a neurodivergent book has to look like it can't look like everyone else it has to stand out and I do find that the children really gravitate to it sometimes they really do and I get I gosh I wish I brought it with me it's in the other room but um children love to recreate these covers um so I'm glad I don't get a say because I would I have no artistic skill <laughs> so I'm not I sometimes get to choose a color like sometimes they'll be like do you want purple or orange and I'll say oh give me purple but um you know this is the US cover of a kind of spark and it's very different so yeah I don't know it's it's ear defenders and hair and it's it's blue and the blue is I think in America is sort of signify like this is about a serious topic but um but that's another reason why I love Kay's designs is that she's sort of saying yes these books are about disability but please please stop thinking that just because something is by a disabled author or because it's about disability that it has to be serious all the time you know this is a this is a book with a lot of fun as well as um as well as serious stuff so no I don't get a say in the covers but I always love them. And Kay is a, is a genius. And, and also I love being able to talk about Kay in schools. Cause when I say, okay, oh, is my illustrator and she's ADHD. And again, it's exactly the same thing. Kids go, Oh, I'm ADHD. I say, well, you could be a cover designer. You could be an illustrator. You could be an author. You could be anything, you know, that's we're, we're neurodivergent adults and we're working in this field and we're doing a good job. That's, that's such an important thing for children to see. I wish I could bring Kay with me to visit, to visits because they always draw her cover so beautifully but um yeah that's a long rambling answer to that very 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 <laughs> concrete question but no I don't get any say but I do do love them and um I'm really glad other people do as well <laughs> <laughs> um El, and, and, um I mean like you said like, like a charm was your first non-lock thing book and the other two were um they were in full on lockdowns where yeah, they were yeah yeah that's right how does it feel um, having in-store and sort of real person face-to-face -face events and readings now? Have you, how, how has that been with, you know, children and adults um, approaching you for signed copies, et cetera, and, and uh, really relaying the, the love of your books? How has that been? Because, that, I mean, that's, that's a new experience for you, isn't it? It's After very, very new. Out. It's very new and it's very overwhelming. So we were just in Portobello doing the, Scotland launch for like a charm let me mm. just pick up again so we're at Portobello bookshop and I was like oh we'll get a couple of people that you know have been there since day one they might you know but we sold out and the the launch was sold out and I actually think it was such a it's been such a nice thing and I've got my we're doing the biggest event we've ever done on Saturday here in London we're doing the South Bank Centre and it's a big auditorium and oh. it's you know we're selling quite a lot of tickets at the moment and um it's very emotional actually after two years of lockdown because you just think like we've all been building this all the community of readers that have come along for every book all the children that are coming I'm getting messages every day going like my you know you know me and my daughter are coming or me and my son are coming and we've been you know we were on that first zoom back in June 2020 and it's it's kind of feels like this incredible big reunion that's about to happen and it's very emotional and it's very um very odd and sort of very specific and authors that 
had their books out before lockdown don't really get it and Mm -hmm. authors that have had their books out without a lockdown you know I was my first two books came out and shops were shut and we weren't allowed to leave the house so I couldn't go and even celebrate with anyone I was just celebrating up by myself on the sofa um with my boyfriend which is fine but to actually be able to go out and see the book in a bookshop and talk to the booksellers and when like on like charms launch day we went to a bunch of Waterstones and the booksellers were so enthusiastic and that really shook me because I thought well these have just been sort of faceless people up until now they've sent nice emails and they've written nice things on their websites but now they're real and it's it's been incredibly emotional it's been really emotional meeting the children was the most it's always emotional to meet your readers Mm -hmm. but it's been really really emotional (laughs) I think Saturday's gonna break me (laughs) I've got to be (laughs) Oh, so, sorry, Ella. It's becoming quite a bit of a, a, an emotional session, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you another question. I hope you don't mind. Um, and uh, it shows who you are. I, I mean, for each of the books, the writing itself is fantastic. You know, they're they're fast paced. They're, they're you know they're thrilling. Um, they are you know you're turning the page. Of what's happening next? What's what they're going to do next? What, what what's going on? Um, I was fascinated with um, personally with with um, pomegranate the the company and um, shows who you are and I immediately thought of Facebook and yeah. the metaverse <laughs> and, you know, you know I think, as, as most people do and the idea of grams and copyright and and um, you know it, it explores great themes uh, grief and, and capitalism um, yeah. <laughs> where, where, where did I mean and um, Adrian he's, he's ADHD and, and we have Cora as well and you've, you've, you've sort of brought them all together on this wonderful strand. Um, how does, where did you get the name Pomegranate from? I mean, I, I, well, no, thanks for asking. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, it's a book with a lot. I, I mean, we're talking for anyone that's not sure, we're talking about book two. Um, all my books are separate. They're not sequels. Um, and this book, we have the most exciting conversations in schools about this book because I grew up. I left school and we were the first generation that had social media while we were at school. So I had Facebook when I was a very young person and we were we were literally guinea pigs. We were on this social media site. And nobody knew what it was. Mm-hmm. Teachers didn't know we were on it. Librarians, parents, nobody had a clue. This was before our parents were on Facebook. We were the, we were the guinea pigs. And so I've always been interested in technology um, in a kind of spark. Nina, Addie's big sister, is a vlogger. Um, who's on YouTube every day living a double life. Um, I'm very interested in social media and technology. It's a theme in most of the books that um, I've written. And I know that children now have grown up completely immersed in the technological social media world. And Show Us Who You Are is about, yeah, as as Derek says, artificially intelligent uh, digital doppelgangers that live forever. And it kind of came from phrases like digital footprint. When people talk about like, oh, your digital footprint, meaning, you know, and I know that schools talk about this a lot with children saying, you know, be careful what you put on the internet because it lives forever, your digital footprint. And I'd always, you know, I'm autistic, so I'm a very literal thinker and I always see the footprint when everyone, when everyone says digital footprint. And I just sort of envisioned a whole kind of body growing up from that footprint and that virtual body that is your your soul uploaded on a computer and you know what if that was real and a company owned it um Mm -hmm. and I love hearing what the children think and um and there was a school that did an exercise about show where they said because in show us who you are um this is a spoiler sort of but inevitably the company start meddling with people's um doubles and start trying to correct them and make them perfect which has you know negative ramifications if you're neurodivergent um so what I love is I went to a school and the whole school had read the book and they'd all done an exercise where they said this is what I will never change about me and and that you know people did I will never change my red hair I will never change my skin color I will never change my vitiligo or my cleft palate there's all of these things and I just thought that's what the book is about it's about saying no to this idea of perfection and the name pomegranate which is the name of the company and is what I wanted to call the book but the publishers wouldn't let me um is what um is from the Greek the Greek myths about pomegranate which is the fruit of the dead it's the fruit of the underworld that if you eat it you know that's but also pomegranate is I think it's in the Adonis myth and it's about perfection it's sort of meant to be representing perfection so that's that's why the company's called pomegranate and then I love when I I have a very precocious young child who likes Greek myths and they go like I know why it's called pomegranate I'm just like yeah (laughs) thank you that's that's great um and it's just about saying no to perfection in the digital sense and in the online sense and saying you know you will never create a perfect version of yourself that will never exist 
virtually or otherwise and nor should it it's not right and it's a great book for getting into conversations about yes about social media but also about you know like deep fakes and all these things that children are aware of that it's important that we talk about and um and I always when we talk about this I say like you know what you see on social media is not real don't like you know it's not real but it's another thing to to actually really know what that means and that's that's what that book is about and um yeah it's got a lot of twists and turns and um people readers like there's a chapter in the book where everything changes and twists and it's chapter 13 and readers like have started sending me pictures of them reading it with sort of like yeah faces (laughs) I don't know how it became a trend but I have a file on my computer of like hundreds of people that are like ah so um yeah it's good fun it all ends happily but yeah it's yeah I did not see that coming at all that was a shock (laughs) what um there's also with in um and show shows who you are. There's also a particularly nasty character. Um, I'm not going to give away any spoilers at all. Mm. But what what I thought again, El, was um, lovely about it was the fact that this particularly nasty character was also shown empathy and understanding, you know, yeah. by other characters within in the novel. That was a lovely touch actually, and and really important, basically. Um, yeah, I, I try. I hope that's something. I can do with all of the characters I mean the villain in a kind of spark is quite black and white and quite because it's told from the point of view of a child and you know mm-hmm. children, the children do see things in quite black and white um but yeah um the villain in show us who you are is is a bit more sympathetic and and I think uh, if you're ch- you know children have mentors that they love and that they look up to and then the minute they realize that that mentor is a human being it's a really sad realization and the show sort of explores that a little bit um so yeah it's a very I yeah I wish I could talk about it without spoiling it but thank you <laughs> I think empathy is really important when you're writing it's really important because um I wonder if, if anybody else has any other questions for L before we begin to to wrap things up feel free to turn your camera and your mic on if anyone would yeah like please <laughs> Oh gosh, I've scared everyone into. I know. Uh, yeah, we've scared everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to when I do school visits. Children are like, "Do you have any pets? What's your favorite band? Where have you travelled? Who do you live with?" And I'm always <laughs> like, I'm being interrogated every single time. So <laughs> I'm not used to quiet when it's a Q and A. I'm used to being asked how much money I make. You know, like it's always, <laughs> always a free for all when it's with the children, which I love. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla, you have your hands up. Would you like to? Yeah. So, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Marvel. Hello. You all right? Yeah. Hi. Um, can I ask what other interests do you have other than writing books and other things? And what you do as an author? What interests do you have? Oh, that's very kind. Um, don't have a lot of time for much else at the moment, but um, I like to. Um, I love the theatre and I love the cinema, and I I do talk a lot with children as well. I'm like reading is so important, and books are obviously the best, and they're obviously superior. But like theatre is great too, and and I'm reading plays is great. So I I love the theatre. Um, and I'm if I ever get a night off from work, I'm usually in <laughs> at, at a show. Um, and I love to cook. Um and I yeah I don't have that many hobbies that's a question that the kids ask they go like what are your hobbies and I always go god I don't have any I just I just work and sleep um (laughs) but um yeah I like um I like fashion if anyone sees me on Instagram you know I like a bit of a dress up so um yeah I like a bit of fashion as well so yeah I'm not that interesting um I'm afraid I I do do, you're very interesting Well, you're very interesting. <laughs> writing books does take a lot of time just sitting staring at the wall and waiting for a sort of something to come and that's quite time consuming yeah. but um yeah no but I like the theatre and I like um cooking and I like um I like animals if I'm waiting I mean again this, I'm thinking of the children every visit they always say do you have pets and I always have to say not yet but I will one day have a dog but yeah um what pet, what pet would you go for a dog I I'd I would get a dog and I would hope that it would make me more social because I would meet other people with dogs. <laughs> like, I don't know how you make friends in your uh, late twenties because you're sort of too old to, I don't know, you're not too old to make friends, but like, I'd like, I'd love a dog. I think that would be easier to, to chat to people if I had a dog. That sounds really creepy. I'm not like trying to like, 
approach strange. I just think it would be a nice little scene to be involved in. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. That's great. Oh, no, thank you. Thanks again. No, lovely to meet you. I have another um, question here from, from Ruth L, who, who asks, if you could say anything to your 12-year-old self, what would you say? Oof, boy. <laughs> right. deeper and deeper um, <laughs> yeah well actually the american public no um actually that's quite a good that's great because when we won the waterson's prize they wanted to do this special edition of a kind of spark and they said can you write a letter to your younger self in the back of the book oh. um so the special edition has that and it is you know i could just i'm not going to read it to you that would be <laughs> that would be very lazy but um but most of it is you know it's quite long it's about a thousand words and it is just sort of remembering and, and acknowledging how difficult it was to be 12 and actually how all-consuming your life is at that time and and what, what to the adults in your life might seem like a trivial um you know you're falling out with your friends or eating by yourself at lunch it might seem trivial to certain adults in your life but for you that day has lasted that one day has felt like 10 years and it's been so difficult and so monumental and your relationships are so important and you just everything is so you know on heart on the sleeve everything is so visceral and um so I would say it's going to be okay and it's actually probably going to be a bit better I think you know childhood is not always golden and wonderful for everyone and I I think it's it's it would be a case of saying you're going to figure out how to stand up for you and people like you without being you know aggressive without being um you know because I had that phase where I was very very angry um you know but you'll find a way to, to walk that kind of path with with self-respect and with dignity and be able to advocate for yourself and it will feel better and it won't always be scary um and bullies are, don't disappear when you turn 18 but you start to understand why they do what they do and that changes your reaction to them and um it's a lot easier to be yourself as an adult than as a child which I think is quite controversial but I really think children are locked into conformity in a way that is really really scary for them and I think children's authors have to remember that they have to remember that they are living in tiny little societies little microcosms that are so rigid in their rules um and it can be really stifling sometimes so I would say it gets better God, that was long. Um, but <laughs> I would say it's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> what a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll read out one more comment from uh, Moira here. It just says, thank you, Elle. So glad you kept fighting. The publishers, you are an inspiration for our pupils and us. Your books are never on my shelves for long and wait until I tell my pupils I attended this event. Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you so much. That's the best thing to hear. Yeah, I'm always fighting publishers. My publishers are great, but I'm still fighting some of the others. We're still we're still deep in our feud. So <laughs> just kidding. Well, thank you so much for coming along today. That was absolutely fantastic. It really was. Mm -hmm.